Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Gabriel Del Corral. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon and medical director for the MedStar Center for Gender Affirmation. Today, I put together a surgical preparation video with a few tips on how to prepare for top surgery. Hopefully, you'll learn a few things during this presentation and prepare you for the next step of top surgery. During this presentation, we'll learn how to choose a surgeon. We'll discuss aspects about the consultation and the best way to prepare prior to surgery, as well as discussing a few details of the post-operative recovery, post-op results, and long-term care. Choosing a surgeon, this is a big step. Of course, the first and most important thing is to check the credentials of the individual that you are evaluating. Plastic surgeons must have an American Society of Plastic Surgery certification uh, or a certification by an American medical board specialty. So do your homework. Make sure that the individual that you're evaluating as your surgeon has done this type of procedures. It is very different to perform a mastectomy for top surgery than a mastectomy for oncologic purpose. Although there are some similarities to the procedure, there are some important aesthetic details and it's not the same procedure. Don't be afraid of, of asking for a second opinion. Everyone does things differently. We say in plastic surgery, there's many ways to fix one problem. So evaluate yourself with other providers and other surgeons to get a different perspective if you have any concerns or any thoughts about different things you want to do. It is important to ask your surgeon to show you some before and after results. This comes with experience. It's important for you to see their work. Important, if you're traveling from long distances, make sure that you prepare yourself properly. If you're coming from far away and having surgery, ask your surgeon how long would they recommend for you to stay in town. It is difficult sometimes to manage complications from long distance or go to an emergency room that is unfamiliar with gender affirming care. It can lead to a bad experience. Make sure that you verify if you're using insurance to cover your procedure. There are some details and co-pays if it's in-network or out-of-network, so you can easily verify this information prior to evaluating your surgeon to make sure that they're in-network with your insurance company. If you're doing self-pay, that's a different story uh, in the sense that it may be a little bit easier to, to pick who you want to go and see, of course. Accessibility. You want to make sure that the surgeon you're selecting is accessible. If there is a problem, if there's a concern long-term, you want to make sure that you have an easy way to communicate with your surgeon as a relationship that you establish with that person, hopefully will be for a long, long time. So make sure that you like the person and you trust them. So what happens during the consultation? I know it can be really stressful to prepare for consultation as you've been waiting for a long time for this time. But relax, it is just really an initial discussion to get to know each other and understand what your goals are. We as surgeons want to make sure that we make you happy and we want to evaluate all the questions that will lead us to understand what are your goals to give you the outcome that you're looking for. Make sure that you discuss with your surgeon all your wishes. Make sure that we know where are you going. Bring your documents. Make sure that if you uh, have any concerns, make sure that you bring documents to your consultation. It's always nice to bring a family member or a friend to make sure they come with you to the consultation. Meet the doc. This is important. You will meet the surgeon and you will meet their staff. This is a, a, a part of the procedure that it's important in the process to make sure that you trust the individual to make sure that they understand what your goals are. Don't be worried about the consultation. It's sometimes it's easy to forget all the questions. It is always easier if you bring a list of all the questions you wanna ask the surgeon. Most surgeons will go through the consultation and as they are talking to you, they would answer many of the questions that you have, but don't be afraid of, real, of writing a list. And when the surgeon is done with their evaluation, don't be afraid of asking questions. This is your time. Make sure that there are no questions moving forward. Don't forget to ask for before and after pictures. It's important to know the work that the surgeon has done. Make sure that you like their results. Make sure that you discuss your goals. And of course, having a patient or someone that you know that have gone through the process through the same surgeon, those referrals, 
uh, are very important as you can be more likely to understand the process and be more comfortable that you chose the right surgeon. Don't be afraid about asking what are the next steps. So you're done with your consultation, you have done, you have decided to move forward with this person. What are the next steps? Some surgeons have certain waiting lists. Sometimes there's more paperwork to be done. There's sometimes there is some uh, information or uh, electronic forms that need to be submitted. So make sure that at the end of the consultation, you ask for your next step so you have a clear idea of the process moving forward after you leave the office. So how to prepare for surgery. I'm gonna give you my particular uh, advice. Many questions ask us to, if there's a need to stop testosterone or HRT and for top surgery, there's no need to stop testosterone. You're gonna have surgery. So there will be probably a few supplies and that you will need prior to surgery. I think it's, it's important to buy, you know, gauze. You're gonna need an antibiotic ointment like a bacitracin or neosporin. Every surgeon uses different types of compression. There are compressions that are more uh, related to a vest with a zipper uh, that adds some compression. There are some surgeons that will prefer a compression that adds more of a binder as well. So all of those are options. Just ask your surgeon if they prefer an option. Uh, sometimes it's easier to buy through two sizes as you are sometimes the swelling decreases. You may be able to go to a smaller size that you purchase and whatever you know, whatever you end up, end up using is easy to return. They'll probably ask you to see your primary care physician as you'll probably need to get some basic lab work to make sure. It is important that you avoid any type of smoking, no nicotine, no vaping. A lot of square patients ask us about THC and we recommend you to stay away from THC at least, you know, four weeks prior to the procedure, smoking at least six weeks prior to the procedure as those uh, substances can increase your anesthesia requirements and, and of course for smoking it can increase your superiority complications and we'll talk a little bit about that. I like Arnica. Arnica is a medication that you can purchase through a GNC or Amazon. Arnica is a herbal supplement that can be very helpful with bruising and swelling. You can purchase this in a topical form or pills and most places will have this. The next most important step is scar care. So gels and silicone tape are very, very important. We recommend using biocornium. This is a type of silicone cream that you can buy or an embrace scar gel, which can be very helpful. It's a 10 week treatment, but remember your scars require a lot of care and the process of scar healing continues for approximately 12 months. The scars will remain red for approximately six to nine months. So be patient, don't give up treating your scars as every little time you invest on them will pay off in the long run. How do we choose the right procedure? What are those factors that are important to know? Well, when you come in for the consultation, there will be an examination. And during that examination, we evaluate different things, such as the degree of breast ptosis or droopiness. We look at the degree of skin elasticity. We look at the degree of skin excess and the actual quality of the skin, sometimes the Skin can have some stretch marks. This indicates that there are some thinning of the dermis and the stretchability of the skin may be affected. We also look at the position of the nipple in relationship to the breast. And depending on this, we determine what is the best procedure. Now, this is a patient who has a, uh, a double incision free nipple graft. I think this is a very common procedure. The goals of surgery and the goals of treatment is to remove the excess breast tissue we want to do everything possible to minimize scar widening. And we can do this minimizing tension. The more tension there is during the closure, the more likely is the scar to become wider and more hypertrophic or red. We also uh, strive to achieve a smaller areola reduction. We want to reposition the areola. We want to resize the nipple. We want to reshape the chest wall contour and minimize scar hypertrophy. So this goals of treatment is very, very important to achieve a good aesthetic result after chest masculinization. Very different than the goals of treatment for a mastectomy for other reasons. So this is a contouring operation with reduction of the skin, with minimizing the formation of scar and the ideal reposition of the scar. And you can see in this procedure double incision, 
gives you the freedom and all the ability to achieve all of those goals. There are multiple technique variations. In my practice, we offer a periareolar technique or the donut incision. We took, we looked at the keyhole incision, the inframammary fold or double incision, and the double incision with nipple preservation or buttonhole. So keyhole, double incision, double incision with nipple preservation, and donut incision as well. So there are some variations of that. And there are other types of scars that are created in different centers do other types of incisions, depending on their experience and their desire to provide those aesthetic results. So the donut mastopexy is a very common option in which the incision is performed around the areola. Through this incision, similar to a keyhole, the incision is circumferential and some of the tissue is removed. Now, in this technique, we can very easily reduce the breast tissue and also reduce the size of the areola. The only problem with the technique is that even with using sutures that are pretty strong and undissolvable, the areola will have a tendency to widen over time. So in my practice, I rarely perform this anymore as I've seen a, role, a lot of areolar widening over time. This is a patient who had a keyhole or periareolar mastectomy. This operation is ideal for those patients who have good skin elasticity, there is no degree of nipple droopiness, and the skin quality looks really good. Small breasts, perhaps an A or even a B cup sized breast. You can see that in this patient, a small incision has been created in the area below the areola, and through this incision, the majority of the glandular area can be contoured and removed in order to have just a better definition of the pectoralis muscle. And this is what chest masculinization strives to perform. This patient also had an area of a keyhole. You can see that because you're reducing the breast tissue, in certain cases, as the skin retracts back down, there could be a small element of areolar diameter uh, it will get a little bit smaller. The nipples will remain the same size, but the areola could become a little bit smaller. And this is another one of our patients as trachyho. The double incision, it's the most common option. This is for those patients who are seeking a masculinization of the chest, but have a little bit of a higher cup size, perhaps a C, D, or larger. They have element of breast droopiness. The nipple is below the inframemory fold, and they have you know, if they would try to put a pencil underneath their breasts, that indicates that there is an element of droopiness or ptosis, and those patients will be better fitted for a double incision with free nipple graft, as you can see in this picture. This allows you to really contour the chest, remove the breast tissue, and place the nipples directly above the pectoralis major muscle, which is ideal. Sometimes you have patients who are a little bit thinner, but also want to make sure that they contour their muscles. For example, this patient could have qualified for a keyhole incision, perhaps. The right side does have a little bit more skin elasticity, so it may be a little bit unpredictable. But the other thing that people forget to talk about is that although the breast is small, this is an A or a B cup size, let's say, and you would may qualify for a keyhole. When you do this operation by making an incision below the areola, there's no ability to reposition the nipple directly above the pectoralis major muscle. Although the breast will become smaller, Perhaps there could be a little migration of the areola, but the nipples literally will stay in the same position or a little bit higher. So in this patient who has a long torso, this patient opted to use a double incision for nipple grafted for two reasons. One, to con contour their pectoralis muscle, which we were able to do, but also they wanted to make sure the nipples were in the right location, which is directly above the muscle. This allows you for a more natural result. So, you know, not, the decision to create a double incision versus keyhole is not only on breast size, it has to do with their aesthetics and the entire aesthetics of the chest and the artistry behind having a nice result. So it's important to have this discussion with your surgeon. The double incision with nipple preservation is another option in which the breast is removed and the nipple is preserved on a pedicle. You can see that this patient has an element of perhaps a little droopiness. It's larger than a B, a C cups uh, breast size. And this patient wanted to preserve the nipple. They want to preserve 
the nipple sensation to have had her degree. And they also wanted to avoid nipple grafting. As you know, nipple grafting can have some variability in the way they scar. But when you're doing a, a keyhole, a per, uh, sorry, a buttonhole technique in which the pedicle is preserved, there's an element of tissue behind the nipple that has to be preserved. So if you're very thin, sometimes you can see that tissue that is left behind the nipple. This patient has a little bit of a higher chest size, so you can really camouflage the tissue behind the nipple and it can give you a natural result. But for this patient, it worked really nicely. So what about when we do a mastectomy, can we add fat to create a better aesthetic result? And the answer is yes, we have done this uh, since we have reported in, this, in the cis female, in the cis male, a literature in which there are areas that could be liposuction as the area shown in blue, and we can add fat to the areas of the medial chest and the lateral inferior chest in order to provide of a better male pectoralis muscle. And this can do it can be done very easily with fat grafting and give you a nice result with this procedure. Unfortunately, it's not always covered by insurance, but liposculture is a great option to define and contour the pectoralis muscle. Non-binary mastectomy is also another option for many patients. Uh, here, this patient has a little bit more of a cleavage and they wanted to really have a mastectomy without nipple reconstruction. And you can see here, the nipple reconstruction has been forgo and we have to connect the scars in the middle to make sure that we have a flat contour. Now, the scars in the middle can be connected in different ways. This patient wanted to create a little bit of a peak. It can be more of a straight or it could be more of a, a curve to it. So, you know, it is a custom operation. You know, you can decide what you want to do during uh, this procedure. So it's good that you think about these options and the customization that you want to have prior to your surgery. Well, one of the most important things about top surgery with free nipple grafted is that the nipple graft can do some, uh, can develop some poor healing during the initial time. Now, sometimes the fact that they look a little bit bad during the first three to four weeks doesn't mean that the nipple is going to be lost. Just be patient, give it time, because the nipples at first will have a tendency to look darker. They sometimes can have a little drainage. They sometimes can even peel superficially, but still have a viable nipple graft. This patient has a partial nipple graft loss. You can see that portion of the nipple grafts have been lost. In this case, what we do is we try to treat the area with hydrogel, give it some time and wait because over time, although in this patient is African American, the pigmentation, the melanin of the nipple has disappeared, creating this whitish appearance. Some portion of the nipple is still in there and it will still survive over time. The hypopigmentation is very common in African American and in my Latino patients, so be patient. It can sometimes take up to one or two years to return. And if the, the, the pigmentation does not return, tattooing also works very well. This is a patient who had an initial, you can see how the nipple looks immediately uh, a week or two after the surgery. Healing takes time, so be patient. This nipple is really, really dark. But over time, you can see over the next six, eight, 12 weeks, those revascularization takes place in the nipple and the nipple is alive. So be patient. Nipple tattoos are another great option. This is a patient who opted to have a mastectomy without nipple reconstruction, and they wanted to see what can potentially look when having nipples. So this patient actually had a tattoo, but a temporary tattoo. This tattoo can stay for a couple of weeks, it can give you the idea of how can your chest look with a nipple tattoo. And if you are certain you want to take this, this direction, then you can get a permanent tattoo. But this is a great option for patients who are not sure if they want to pursue nipple tattoos. What about the recovery? Well, recovery, it can be a long process. Recovery in general can take approximately three weeks. And it may take about six weeks until you'll be able to return to gym or swimming or increase physical activity. Have a care team in mind as some friends, perhaps some family or significant other, they can help you around during your recovery time. Your care team, your surgeon, your, the medical facility, you know, we always have ability to help with patients. You're never alone. If you feel like you're gonna go through this process alone, please let your surgeon know, please let me know so we can find tools to help you. We also have amazing patients who have been through the process and they have, 
you know, they're really helpful and really kind to help other patients. So we know many people that are willing to help and definitely we want to make sure that you are accompanied during this journey and not, there's no need to do it by yourself. Pain management is also very important. Usually most patients, when we're doing breast surgery, the pain is not usually very, very severe. Most of the time, the narcotics are, we are weaned off during the first week or so, and it's not uncommon to just require Tylenol or ibuprofen perhaps during the first few days after the surgery, and perhaps after two weeks, you're completely off all medications, so it's not uncommon. If you have a low uh, sensitivity to, tr to pain or you have some history of hypermyalgia and you are seeing a pain management doctor, Make sure that you talk to them and let them know that you'll be having top surgery so you can formulate a plan with them prior to visiting your surgeon. Drains are also important. Some surgeons opt to not use drains and they increase the amount of sutures that they use in order to obliterate the, spa the space during the mastectomy and they have great outcomes. In my practice, I like to use the drains. I have gone, yeah, either way, I've tried no drains and, and drains and I think in my experience, I think the drains are beneficial for most patients as they can eliminate any residual fluid, any hematoma, and expedite the swelling and the healing process of your patient. Most of the time, the drains are only there for approximately one week. So during your first follow-up appointment, the drains are generally always removed. Recovery time, as I'd said, usually takes about three weeks and six weeks until you'll be able to return to full physical activity. Nipple care is important. We will show you how to provide care through your nipples, usually a small amount of antibiotic ointment and a Vaseline gauze or a Band-Aid or any type of gauze over the nipples are very helpful. When you're showering, it's important that if you're still in the early stages of nipple graft healing, you can shower, but make sure that you turn your back or to the side. Don't let the shower pressure hit directly to the nipples as the nipples are still very delicate in the healing process. Sensation is also very common to have areas of numbness, or perhaps the whole chest can be numb initially, and this can feel really odd. So make sure that you're careful with any specific hot water or hot compresses. You don't want to burn yourself. And remember that sensation will return over time. Sometimes it can take up to one year for the nurse to recover, but there are multiple sensory nerves to come back in that area. We're right now experimenting with neurotization of the nipple, which means we're connecting nerves to the nipple graph in order to provide sensation. We have had some early findings that are positive, but hasn't been you know, equally effective on everyone yet. So stay in tune for some advances on that chapter. Long-term uh, care surveillance and car cancer surveillance is important. And we'll talk a little bit about that after the next slide. So next, I wanna share with you a video about what to expect during your first visit, drain removal, as well as the management of nipples. So please watch this video in the meanwhile. Your output has come down nicely, so it is ready to say goodbye to the drain. So I'm going to talk you through everything that we're going to do yep. so you understand kind of the process. one little stitch that is holding this drain in place. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to snip that little stitch, all right? And then we'll gently remove this drain. Now, you will feel a little bit of a tug as I take the drain out, but mm -hmm. this should not be painful at all, mm -hmm. okay? I'm just stripping that and make sure we're... That looks good. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. I want you to take a deep breath in and down. Good. All right. You did great. Looks really good. All right. This dressing that I'm going to put on here is a waterproof dressing. You can shower right off the top of it. It usually takes about three to four days for these little holes to close. And once they close, Okay, that drain can go. You can shower over this. If it gets a little messy because you get a little bit of discharge or bruising on there, just change that dressing up. So you can use Bacitracin, you can use Neosporin, triple antibiotic, one, it all works the same way. Okay. Is 
that's that's the trace available over the counter. Or? All of that's available over the counter. Okay. Yeah. You just want to be sure every day when you shower, you clean, you get all the residual ointment off of there, so it's not just building up on your incision. Okay. Okay. And then you're still using your compressive vest, so so that's not rubbing on there. Mm -hmm. Just any kind of dressing. You can gauze and tape if you want. You can use a nice band aid. Just anything to protect it while your vest is still. Have you started treating your scars yet? No. Okay. Did you end up getting any, any of the products we recommend, scar lotion, scar, uh, or the strips, anything like that? No, not yet. Okay. So, I'll write some things down. There's a couple different options for you. You can start using any of the silicone strips that you may want to. Mm -hmm. um, we like that uh, Embrace is a really good brand to get on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, you can get it at some pharmacies, mm -hmm. but Amazon's the easiest place to get it. It's super sticky. It works really well in them, but you don't have to use that brand. You can mm -hmm. use like CVS silicone sure. strips, wherever you want. But what you'll do is you'll start using those now, and you'll put those right onto the incision lines. It's meant to be used for about the first two months after surgery. Okay. Okay. Um, after the first two months, you want to transition to a scar lotion that you're going to actually get in there and massage and work into okay. the scar. Um, so a lot of patients will, will do either or. Now, you can actually start with a scar lotion massage if you want to, mm -hmm. um, but the silicone strips are easy and they're nice. You mm -hmm. just don't need to think. You put them on, last for five to seven days. Okay. Uh, you don't even need to think about it. Okay. What about postoperative long-term care? So for patients who are trans males who undergo a breast reduction, for example, some patients opted to have a breast reduction, the cancer screening guidelines are for the patients to undergo a mammography similar to cisgender females, you know, past the age of 40. In patients who had a double incision or any type of mastectomy, well, self-breast examination is going to be important, but also if the patient has a high risk, uh, history or any history of BRCA gene positivity, then those patients may be needing an MRI to ensure no areas of concern uh, during the, you know, during the imaging, of course. So in conclusion, the take home message is that preparation is the key and by watching this video, you're already ahead of the curve. Taking time is okay. Take time to review the information. Take time to think about the procedure that you want to have. Remember that many of these procedures are irreversible. So once you do it, it's hard to return to the shape and the aesthetics prior to the surgery. Complications are rare and are very treatable, usually for a short period of time. Satisfaction is actually quite high after top surgery. And revisions may be needed in certain cases to improve the result. This is not a defeat. This is a small procedure that may be required in order to achieve a better aesthetic result. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please email us at agenda.affirmation at medstar.net. Thank you. Good luck on your surgery and bye-bye.